Good afternoon. I hope all of you are enjoying your snow day. I wanted to take a few moments just to record a little bit more lecture for you since, of course, we are missing our class today. And, well, when we get back on Friday, I expect that we need to move on. I want to pick up where we left off with the French Revolution and sort of put things into a bit of a bigger perspective for us. The most important moments in the French Revolution really come down to the adoption of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen um, on August 26, 18, 1789. The Judicial Code um, and the autonomy of the sovereign nation state of France are really outlined in this document, and the document itself is very heavily influenced by Enlightenment ideals. Um, it prescribes, for example, the equality of men and the citizens of France. Um, and it does a very, very good job of sort of laying out what is the sort of general tone of the revolution, which was basically to sort of upend this very unequal class system. It does, however, fall short of providing any meaningful improvements in the lives of women or anyone who doesn't own property. And in fact, that property ownership qualification is something that you'll see crop up from time to time in different revolutions and their outcomes. For example, in the American Revolution, when the Constitution was written, it doesn't actually expressly say who can or cannot vote. And most state legislatures made it very, very clear that you had to be male, white, and own property. And that property qualification will see rise up from time to time. We mentioned the Women's March in 1789 and the formation of a new constitution in 1791 that tried to get a constitutional monarchy. The reality, though, is that the different polarized groups within France are going to try very hard to each get their own way. The true monarchists, of course, are going to balk at any sort of constitutional monarchy, and the true republicans are going to balk at any sort of monarchy, period. The constitutional monarchy would be sort of seen as a middle ground. We mentioned that the Austrians and Prussians, of course, end up joining in, trying to restore the French monarchy, and of course that Marie Antoinette herself was none other than the sister of the Austrian Emperor Josef II. The French, of course, declare Austria in return, who, along with the Prussians, now begin to fight France. The Constitution... Um, eventually will abolish the monarchy altogether and create something known as the French Republic. And it is at that point that Louis XVI tries to make his escape with his wife, but of course is caught. They are imprisoned at Tuileries and will be beheaded for treason in 1793, her in October and him several months before. At this point, Spain and Britain gear up to join the fight, and things get serious enough for the French to decide to throw out the entire constitution and create something new the Committee of Public Safety under Robespierre. The Committee of Public Safety basically did the opposite of what its name implied. Over the next year, about 40,000 people would find their end at the guillotine, which boils down to about 110 people per day. The era becomes known as the Reign of Terror and becomes so terrible that the committee eventually guillotined Robespierre himself. In 1795, they instead established something known as the Directory. In 1799, the Directory government would be overthrown by one of its star generals, Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon names himself First Consul and institutes in 1804 something known as the Napoleonic Codes, a severely patriarchal document that recognized the equality of all men, but not women and children. A much modified version of the code is still in use today that actually does provide those protections for women and younger persons. Beginning in 1804, really even earlier, beginning in 1800 or so, Napoleon begins this war of expansion. He conquers Austria and Prussia and Spain, three actors who, of course, were trying very, very hard to stop the French Revolution. He then moves forward and conquers Portugal and the Italian kingdoms. He dissolves the weak, ailing Holy Roman Empire and crowns himself emperor of a brand new empire in 1804. The empire continues to grow until 1812, when Napoleon makes a fatal tactical error. He decides to invade Russia in the winter. Of course, the only people who can stand up to a Russian winter are Russians themselves, and the disastrous campaign basically leads to the downfall of Napoleon. He will be exiled to a tiny island off the coast of Italy known as Elba. In 1813, about a year later, he manages to escape Elba, return to the south of France, march north to Paris, and eventually try to re-establish his control over France in what becomes known as the Hundred Days Government. The British, of course, find that this simply will not do, 
and begin to launch their own counterattack, where they defeat him at the very famous Battle of Waterloo, at which point he is exiled, again, permanently to St. Helena. If you look at a map and you look at Elba, the original exile island, you'll notice that it's very close to the Italian coast, within sight of it, really. If you look at a map and try to find St. Helena, you'll find it is in the smack middle of the Atlantic Ocean. No chance for escape.